Hey guys, I want to take a minute to talk to you about how we are doing so much here at Liberty Talks. And I have one word for you, Anchor. Anchor Anchor.fm is how we went from being on only a few podcast hosting sites from being on over a dozen different mainstream podcast hosting sites, including Apple and Spotify. You name it, we're on it. And Anchor did that for us. Not only did it do that, but you can also find music, find ads, and it'll help you produce your podcast. What else could you possibly want from a podcast hosting site? We use Anchor here at Liberty Talks and think you should too. Go check out Anchor and remember to subscribe to Liberty Talks on all of our platforms. We have to find a way to talk and have dialogue and be tolerant between other views. You have to have open dialogue, and that's where free speech is so important. Consent is a very important thing, and today in the Me Too movement, it's been very important because I think it's really opened up a lot of eyes. Cannabis is a healing herb. We as the people, we need to stand up and make a move. If you committed sexual assault, it doesn't matter when it was, you should be held accountable for that. However, we have to make sure that we actually make sure they committed sexual assault, and we have to make sure that all allegations are verified. So put in these programs thinking that it'll help everyone, but what they forget is that the pathway to hell is paved with good intention. And I think that's what this whole movement is all about anyways, is uh, trying to be open to ideas. Welcome to Liberty Talks Podcast with John Douglas, and today we have a very special guest, Mr. Marco Roberts from Log Cabin Republicans. Marco, thanks so much for being here. Hey, glad to, ha- glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. So uh, first, to start off, we're going to be asking Marco some questions about how Republicans can do better and how we can all come together as Republicans and actually start making policies that's based on ideology and not just based on whatever specific law is out there, which uh, we'll get to that. But first, Marco, tell uh, the audience a little bit about yourself, for people who don't know you. Well, you know, um, um, uh, I've really uh, started activism a lot when I was in college, like when I was your age. And um, I, and I know you guys are very active. I know you guys have that big free speech speech ball outside, which yes, I hope to sign later. Um, and so my first foray with activism really was when I was at Texas A&M. And got involved in the court case, uh, which is really a free speech court case for gay students. And eventually that court case was settled in our favor. It was gay student services versus Texas A&M. And um, then I had a big hiatus. Of course, it was a very different time for a gay person at that point to be open, especially I was already becoming a, a Republican. Um, well, what date was that? What, what, when was that around? Oh, I'm not, I, don't, I don't like to say. But actually, <laughs> you know, it was during the Reagan years. So around 84 is when I started becoming a Republican. Okay. And I started realizing that uh, that's where my, my sentiments lay. Uh, which was interesting because even then, the activists, uh, people might, who might have been called gay activists, would have all been very left progressive. But when I was at A&M, uh, that's when I started encountering a lot of these leftist progressive ideas and um, kind of woke me up. And so even though I was the you know the president of the Gay Student Services at the time and, and you know was an advocate for free speech and um, not many people were out in those days, uh, I also decided that I was adamantly opposed uh, to leftist progressive ideas, which I thought were actually more dangerous and more totalitarian and controlling than what we were fighting at the time. But now, um, about four years ago, I started getting involved back with Republican politics because I was watching in frustration how many Republicans struggle with these social issues, don't seem to know how to answer them, and um, and really, in many ways, seeming to seat the ground to, to the left on these issues. So uh, it seems to me, from my perspective, that so often what I see happen is Democrats, leftist progressives, whatever you want to call it, uh, define what the issues are. And then what we have is Republicans either reacting in a very reactionary way to it, um, sometimes uh, almost, you may say, far right or whatever it was, but it's reactionary. It's not really looking at what the issue is and simply saying no to whatever has been presented. And then the Republicans on the other side who uh, you might say more moderate, which for whatever reason, do side with the Democrats. And then what we end up with is a split where the Republicans are now fighting each other over these social issues. And so it seems like every time the Democrats successfully divide us, when in fact what we should be doing is looking at these issues not in terms of how Democrats define them for us. I say Democrats or leftists, but how we as Republicans or libertarian-leaning Republicans or libertarians, how we would ourselves look at this issue instead of how it's being defined for us. And so I decided to get involved. Um, And next thing I know... um, 
got involved with Law County Republicans. I decided that they seem to be a legitimately Republican group after all. Uh, I think there was a time where a lot of them were accused of simply being a cover for Democrats in Republican clothing. Um, and uh, became president of the organization in 2016. And we have since then taken it in a different direction. So uh, really trying to take this approach that I just described. That's great. Can you tell us a little bit more about Log Cabin Republicans? So Log Cabin Republicans, and so I'm president of the Houston chapter, which you know I'm happy to say now is one of the biggest in the country. Wow. Um, wow. So we're very proud of that. Uh, it's it's definitely grown in the in the last uh, uh, few years. And and I say that as an example. For example, when I first joined, when I first became president of Log Cabin, our annual Lincoln dinner had about 56 attendees, whereas our Lincoln dinner with Dan Crenshaw uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, at the Sam Houston Hotel downtown, downtown Houston, uh, drew 160 uh, folks. Wow. So it's a you know as you can see almost a threefold increase uh, in the span of uh, three and a half years. Um, and um, so Law County Republicans is an organization as a whole that was born in California during, in fact, the Reagan years. Uh, and and it, stemmed, it stemmed from something called the Briggs Initiative. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I have not. Yeah, it was before you before you were born. I'm sorry, <laughs> but. So what happened was, you know, Reagan, Reagan, as we all know, is sort of a a conservative icon uh, um, and also an icon of the Republican Party. And at the time, he was governor of California. And there had been this initiative that had had been come uh, come up with uh, by uh, somebody called Anita Hill. or not sorry, Anita Bryant. Excuse me. (laughs) Sounds like I missed uh, those names mixed up. But um, and what uh, what that initiative did basically was it was going to try to make it illegal for a gay person to be a teacher. It was basically a target against homosexuals. Um, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it anti-LGBT because it had nothing to do with trans. It was a specifically targeted at gay folks. And um, Reagan came out against it. And basically he felt that to do something like this would be to start a witch hunt on teachers and just did not want uh, this kind of thing to happen in the state. And that carried a lot of credibility because he was a conservative Republican by this time. And so um, that encouraged a lot of gay folks at the time who didn't really feel like they have a home that um, to uh, organize in opposition to the Briggs Initiative, encouraged by Reagan, and that's how Law Cabin was formed. So Law Cabin then became this um, uh, organization of Republicans that was primarily advancing uh, the viewpoints of gay Republicans, and it has been that way so for the last forty years. Now, in more recent times, you know they've they've uh, uh, allowed chapters to be uh, you know create themselves or uh, across the country. And so national charters, individual chapters, as long as we can subscribe to the mission of law County Republicans at the national level. Uh, nonetheless, um, there is a difference between what we do in Houston and say what we do, what they do in, in, in the, in, at the federal level. Uh, some people might even argue that uh, we're on slightly different pages, and I wouldn't disagree with that necessarily. But fortunately, it's a very decentralized organization. So national really deals with federal issues whereas the local chapters are allowed to deal with local and state issues. So Law Cab in Houston has a lot of discretion on how it wants to approach uh, local ordinances, state laws, uh, who, which, who it wants to endorse at a state or, or local level. Uh, that, excuse me. That's great. Uh, so I, as you know, I'm uh, with the Young Americans for Liberty at U of H, and you actually came and gave a speech to us. And I think it was one of the greater speeches I've heard given on campus. I've even hosted people like Dinesh D'Souza, and I thought yours was much better. Oh, wow. That's a high compliment. I have to tell him. (laughs) You you should. But uh, one thing you're very big on is the idea that you were talking about earlier. Republicans don't set the uh, – don't create the debate. They just react to things. That's one of my biggest problems with the Republican Party right now is that they don't actually set – the groundwork they just react and uh um, and that, that's my biggest problem along with that republicans don't actually make good arguments against the left what they usually do is they make efficiency arguments and i think they should be making moral arguments but you gave a speech in which you talked about broccoli and i've never thought about broccoli more since i've met you uh but, but it's, a, it, it's, it's a good thing and uh so can you tell us a little bit about this uh speech you made because it's actually pretty effective and as we've, uh, as I've seen lately, and I've talked to other Republicans around Houston, you've seen people like Dan Crenshaw have even picked up on it and has been using it a little bit. So can you tell us about uh, why broccoli has uh, become a big thing in Houston? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, before I get to that, I, it's interesting that you say that the comment about the frustration with Republican arguments. And uh, I was ta- I was actually meeting with uh, uh, Governor Aberstaff last, actually, we were meeting, Law Cabin, Texas was meeting with several folks last, yesterday about this. And one of the things that... Um, we talked about is exactly that same issue. Um, I think it's, 
I think our message is beginning to resonate with some Republicans because now we're, they're asking more and more about how to deal with some of these issues. Um, and it's also uh, makes me think of a, a comment I made at our dinner, um, uh, at our annual fundraising dinner. I know you didn't, didn't have a chance to get there. And frankly, if I'd known you earlier, I would have gotten your free ticket. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but one of the things I, I pointed out there, I said, you know what, sometimes I f- it feels like, I mean, don't you get the feeling that if it was put on us by the left to defend the proposition that two plus two equals four, we would fail. We would not be able to make the case because we don't know how. That's how bad we've gotten in advancing right. our cause. So the, the issue with the broccoli case, you know, in our presentation, uh, the argument that I've made there, um, and we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to present this uh, the speech that you heard, a version of it, to Dan Crenshaw's office about a year ago. And what is basically it's this, and um, this is sort of, the, I guess, the, the condensed version. You know, if, you know, Michael Bloomberg, who was was a pseudo-Republican, now we know he really never was. Basically a communist now. <laughs> well, you know, he, definitely a person who thinks he knows better than you on how you should eat and what you should do. And, and uh, so he was mayor of New York and um, really won that uh, that race on the on the backs of Rudy, Rudy Giuliani's success. Uh, but once he became in office, you started realizing that he wasn't really a Republican. He was really somebody who uh, likes controlling people's choices and, and started passing all kinds of laws and ordinances, uh, not just banning smoking and, and even on the street, but also trying to tell restaurants what kinds of ingredients they could have, you know, on their menus, what the soda sizes you could sell, you know, because he didn't think people should have a big, big gulp or anything like that. And so in my presentation, I point out, well, you know, what if someone like Michael Bloomberg became president and decided that, you know, we all should eat broccoli because it's good for us and studies show that broccoli is good for us. And we know the left loves to talk about studies. That's how they always justify everything the studies say. Um, and a la Obama decided to implement a whole system where every household, everybody had to you know, file taxes and, and show receipts of how much broccoli you fed your family, ate yourself, because that would help us cover health care costs and whatnot. And the thing I always say is, you know what Republicans would do? You know, what we would do in outrage and opposition, legitimate outrage, of course, we would be justified in opposition to us. But what we would do, and it would be to form an, uh, organize all kinds of organizations uh, opposing the, you know, the, 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 the right to be forced to eat broccoli. We would say everything would be based on the right not to eat broccoli. We would pass laws, we would form organizations, all in opposition to being forced to eat broccoli and saying we have the right not to eat broccoli. And the next thing you know, the debate then would be about broccoli. And now we were shifting to that. And that's where the problem begins, because now it would be, well, is broccoli good for you or not good for you? And, of course, studies show that it is good for you, right? And we would be missing the bigger argument. And, the, and, and, and what if not only would be a harder way to defend that, but then let's say you did win. Let's say that in the end, all your efforts to uh, secure your right not to eat broccoli succeeded and you finally got it into law. And there it is, a nice little new law that says you have the right not to eat broccoli. What you've really done is conceded the argument everywhere else because what you should have been fighting for is the right to eat whatever you want. But you didn't do that. Instead, you focused on this one thing, which is hard to defend, and then you actually implicitly conceded everything you didn't cover in that law. So we do that with similar things on non-discrimination and the opposition to same-sex marriage. There's a lot of efforts at the state capitol right now and they're all trying to stop people from being forced to bake cakes or do florists or all kinds of things, right? But the opposition, like SB 15, uh, which I don't think is going to go anywhere now, but um, or HB 1035, sorry, is basically based on that. Is trying to form all this the right not the right to oppose same-sex marriage. When in fact, what you should be doing is the right to believe whatever you want. That the government doesn't have the right to tell you what you should think about marriage. Period. And that's what you should be defending. But we're making so too often our, our our reaction is to what I call a broccoli argument. We we respond to that when it's not about the broccoli. It's about the fundamental freedom underlying it. So when somebody brings to you a broccoli law or some kind of concept like that, you should say, Well, that's not the issue. The underlying issue is what is what do I as a person who believes in freedom or limited government should respond to this? And what's the underlying question? It's not the broccoli. But don't let that make it. So I always tell people, don't make it about the broccoli because now you're getting sidetracked and you may even list, lose the argument. And even under the best case scenario, should you win the argument, you still lost anyway in the long run. Yeah, and this is a problem I've had. Ever since you've told me that speech, uh, that presentation, I've really started to see it a lot, especially in the uh, abortion area. We, uh, we see a lot of Republicans usually trying to pass bills that's uh, pro-life. And uh, as you might know, I'm a pro-life writer. I'm very big in the pro-life cause. And 
you know, they're passing things like heartbeat bills now, which I think is great. It's good. But to me, that when you pass like the heartbeat bill or uh, these type of bills that limits abortion up to a certain point, I feel like it is a concession that anything before that is all right. Whereas what we should be arguing is that life begins at conception and to take away that life after conception is to kill a human being. And by not arguing that, we are giving ground. And ever since you've told me the, that presentation and you've taught me why uh, why broccoli can be such an awful uh, thing, I've, I've really uh, started noticing it around everywhere. I think that that's really effective and something that Republicans should be uh, more aware of. I think that's a concept that should uh, go outside Houston and should become more national in the Republican platform to talk more about the not the issue at hand, but the overarching issue of the right to do something, uh, such as an abortion case, the right to life, whereas not the right to life up to this point, but the right to life from conception. And I think it's very effective in making Republicans see that. Well, I hope I hope other Republicans do pick that up. Um, you know, we've been doing that presentation, and uh, I'm looking forward to also, by the way, uh, I've been invited by the, the Texas Young Republican Federation to speak at their state convention, and so we'll talk about it there as well. Um, so, about, although I will say to, for the, your listeners that the presentation is a lot more effective where you can actually see my presentation with the picture of the broccoli. So, But I do agree with you that this concept, you know, obviously as law count Republicans of Houston, and, and, and working with law cabin Republicans of Texas, uh, we dealt with a lot with the social issues. That's what we're really talking about. You know, like, do you force a, a baker to make a cake? You know, do you do that? Uh, what about the bathrooms questions? And, and we keep trying to pull them back and saying, you guys are getting t- caught up in all this. You have legitimate freedoms here. But it does apply to other issues. So it's not just about, you know, the issues that we're dealing with. But I think this applies to immigration issues. It does apply to abortion issues. It applies to a whole lot of issues. Unfortunately, I do think that we are failing in almost all of them for the very reason that on every one of them, the Democrats or the left are on the offensive, determining where we fight these issues on, you know, what the what the polemics are about it. They tell us what the words are, you know, what the parameters are, and then we just engage in it. And and we don't realize that, first of all, we should we should be the ones stepping back and saying, what is the actual argument that we have to, you know, what really is at issue here? Um, I know they tell us. You know, that it's discrimination or, or it's racism or something like that. But is it really? And we need to stop being so afraid of being so defensive when they accuse us of these things and saying it's none of these things. It's something much more under much more fundamental. So I agree with you on that as far as it applies to other issues, including pro-life issues. Yeah, this is what's really annoying about the political debate. Democrats do this a lot where they'll make a bill titled like uh, Justice for Women's Act. And inside of it, it will be socialism for everyone. We're going to take everyone's money because justice for women. And you're like, no, that's that's bad. And, here's, and Republicans make two problems on this. They won't just say that's bad because, one, it's not actually justice for women. They also say that, it, that uh, taking other people's money is going to make the economy worse and uh, it's going to make us more like Venezuela. Whereas that efficiency argument isn't good enough because now you're basically, because now Democrats get to say, why aren't you willing to give up some of your money uh, for to make women live better. Well, what's so, interesting about the efficiency argument is that the Democrats never believe in that efficiency argument when it goes against them. So, you know, we have to be willing to always be more consistent on that because this, this it's not just about efficiency, but it's about principles, right? right? Um, you know, Democrats would never agree to give on a principle even if it's just more efficient to do so. And so why should we? That's the thing that gets us. So, but again, it's an example of we take the bait. They gave us a parameter, and then we feel compelled to defend every single little bit. And going, it's kind of like somebody launching, you know, fireballs at you, right. and all you do is keep trying to hose every single fireball that lands instead of hitting the launching pad. That's what you should hit. Otherwise, you're going to spend your time constantly going around like a like the you know like the fire brigade uh, brigade kind to uh, stop all these fires. You'll never finish because they just keep launching them at you. So, um, yes, I I I, I think that. It's one of these things where we really need Republicans to step back. And, and I would say an example of that continues to be, obviously, of interest for me, for example, this whole issue of, um, uh, you know, the, I talk about the cake. And I had the opportunity to author a, uh, an op-ed with Susanna Ducky Pill in the Houston Chronicle last summer regarding the, you know, the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision. I don't know if you had a forbidden with a case. Yeah, I've, I've written a lot of articles about it. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so, well, I've only got the one, sorry. But... <laughs> Um, I'm sure yours is better than mine. Well, I don't know, but it was, you know, it, I, did, it did, I did, we did get it through the Chronicle. I don't know how, but it's on there. And um, but what it, it's trying to explain to people, you know, people often ask me, you know, how can I, as a gay person, 
defend someone's right not to bake a cake? You know, how can I do that? I say, well, because I wouldn't want to be forced to do something against my will either. And then they ask, well, how, where do you draw the line? How do you, you know, do you want, are you for discrimination? And this is, of course, the question that traps Republicans and some libertarians as well all the time. Even last night I was watching Fox News and they get, again, they talk about discrimination. and They're scared of that word. They're scared of that word and they freeze and they don't know how to, how to defend it. And Mike Pence, of course, he lost his presidential aspirations precisely because he couldn't answer that question when he was on TV with George Stephanopoulos trying to defend his Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And again, that's what I would call a broccoli law. Its intention is right. It's trying to protect something legitimate, but it's doing it so specifically that it got caught up in the broccoli and, of course, became easy to attack. Um, and because he couldn't answer that question, he, as we know, is not president and we have somebody else. And it's one of those areas where we need to get Republicans more aware of how to get to the underlying issue. In the case of the uh, cake bakers, florists, folks like that, when they say, where do you draw the line? I always say, you draw it where the Civil Rights Act drew it 50 years ago and has done very well for that time. We haven't had any issues. It's only since these new laws, that's what people don't understand, these new laws that are being crafted are not like the old ones. You know, when HERO was being passed in Houston when you were probably still in high school, um, um, that law was often portrayed by the left and even some folks on our side as nothing more than the civil rights at the local level. But it really was not true. It actually changed a whole lot of things and expanded the definition of public accommodations to mean practically anything that moved, which is unfair. Um, and, it, and started using issues of non-discrimination as a way to chip at way at free speech, First Amendment rights, and property rights. And that's kind of a danger. So one of the things that I'm very big on, uh, because even though I'm Republican, I'm also very libertarian-leaning, which is why I like you guys, you know. Uh, so I always call myself a libertarian-leaning Republican right. uh, because... I am concerned and I do not appreciate people taking non-discrimination issues that are legitimate as a way to diminish a right that's even more important and more fundamental, which is the First Amendment right and your property rights and the right to decide to what you're going to put your hands and mind to work. Hey, here's the thing that bothers me about Republicans when it comes to discrimination. They're so scared of that word, except discrimination isn't actually a bad thing. There's three types of discrimination. Uh, I can't remember the names for it, but there's a discrimination we don't like where you are object you are saying that's a person I don't like because of X quality. Therefore, I'm going to discriminate against that person. That's the bad type of discrimination. The other two types of discrimination, uh, discrimination aren't so bad. In fact, one of them is actually good. So the second type of discrimination is whenever, let's say the government says that you are not allowed to look at someone's criminal history or do a background check on them because we might view that as racist. So you're a business owner. You want to hire someone. Well, now, since they can't do a background check on you, they're going to be less likely to hire black people because, on average, the black community has higher crime rates. And that disproportionately affects black people even worse now because they're being discriminated against uh, in their jobs because the government is making it where you can't access individual information. So that one's not bad on the business owner. That one's bad on the government. The business owner is just using what information he has to make a judgment. And then there's the third type of discrimination, which is actually good. is the discrimination we use in our day-to-day -day lives. Like if you want to drink water or orange juice, well, if you choose water, you've discriminated against orange juice. And it goes even so far as who do you want your partner to be in life? You're uh, like, I have a fiance. Uh, by having a fiance, I've now discriminated against every single woman in the entire world because I've said that this woman I'm with is superior to all the other ones. And um, and this is something that Republicans need to get a hold of. Not all discrimination is bad in that way. And where the Democrats are going wrong is they actually are saying all those types of discrimination, uh, uh, discrimination is bad, all three types. And have you read the book Brave New World? Oh, yes. Yeah. And you actually, that, that's kind of, in some parts, it's what the book <clears throat> is about, that any type of discrimination is bad. And you see that in this intersectional society we have that where you're allowed to have any partner you want. And you talked about this with the LGBT stuff, how the T is in complete conflict with the LGB because what, what you're essentially saying is that if you are gay but won't be the transgender person and that makes you transphobic even though you're part of the LGBT movement, you see it eats itself. And that's something that Brave New World shows that uh, once you get to that point, then all types of discrimination becomes bad. And therefore, you have to be with everyone. Even the good type of discrimination, which our society relies on, becomes bad. And that's bad for society. So uh, we're, uh, where do you fall into that? Do you, uh, do, do you uh, think there should be a line drawn where discrimination is bad and where discrimination is good? I think, you know, it's interesting. You can, actually, you know, you can, you can always do my presentation. Right? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's, you, you raise a very important point. And it's all about what does, non, what does discrimination actually mean? And I think 
what the left has been very successful at doing is is infusing the word discrimination with an emotion, which unfortunately too many Republicans share. And so, and I hear too many people when as soon as they hear the word discrimination, it's almost like a uh, light turns off. And now it's simply of how do I avoid being discriminatory, regardless of the fact whether the discrimina- discrimination in this case is legitimate or not. And you make an excellent point, as I do in my presentations, as you know, um, which is to emphasize to folks that discrimination is nothing more than discernment. And we don't say discernment is bad. Uh, we sometimes think discernment is good. All the Civil Rights Act intended to do back before discrimination became a, uh, you know, a, a word that triggered people was to tell the difference. And all it meant to do is, when is it okay to tell the difference or dis- make a distinction, and when is it not? That's all. But And as you point out, um, also, the, there are many folks that are getting so extremist on this non-discrimination that they actually tell, and they write articles that say that if you don't date trans people, you're discriminatory, that you should have to, like, as if your choice of a personal partner, which was the whole point of the gay rights movement, that was the core of it, which was you get to choose, that, that is, discriminate on your own basis of what you think is appropriate for you. And now to have, in what is now referred to, I would say, not accurately, the, the GLBT or LGBT community, um, which really is ultimately multiple separate communities, to have that same element to start saying, no, no, you don't have the right to decide who you want to partner sexually or not is almost amazing that that, can, that, can, that case can be made in gay publications today, which is the opposite of what we would have been saying 50 years ago. And again, it comes back down to what is discrimination. And as you point out, in law, we have m- many favorable discrimination. In other words, we discriminate in favor of veterans. We discriminate in favor of uh, people under certain conditions. Or we discriminate in favor of people with medical situations that are unique. And one of the things that has happened in particular with the trans issue, which sometimes is lumped as an LGBT issue, but again, as you point out, I, I just say it's a different issue because what, 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 trans issues are, are not the same as gay issues. They have nothing to do with each other. They are uh, the only commonality is that they're minority issue, but other than that. And we are not able to even respond accurately to laws that are coming on the books now, like in California, already in Canada, where uttering words is now a crime. That has happened. So in Canada recently, there was a court decision where a candidate for office was literally found guilty of a crime for using words biological male. That's unheard of we, in our country. California passed recently a law that does the same thing for medical professionals in their service. And feelings, personal feelings aside, do you realize that in our country, even the N-word is not illegal? It's not a crime. Yeah. We don't make racism a crime for a reason. And, and I always point out to people, racism is not a crime in our country for a reason. Because the moment you make it a crime, that means now the government gets to decide what, what qualifies. And as you know, as you hear our folks talk, a lot of people call a lot of things racism. So who gets to decide that? And next thing you know, speech now becomes a test for the government to decide well, what's acceptable. And we, we, we reject that. But we still don't have Republicans able to articulate that very simple point. So... Um, uh, when it comes to trans issues, let's give you an example. People say, well, just to show you how uh, uh, how weird this has gotten, how, how totally uh, upside down the term has become, they'll say, well, you shouldn't discriminate um, against trans people in bathrooms. Well, we don't. That's the point. The issue isn't discrimination or uh, against trans people. It's the fact that we don't discriminate against trans people. The real question today is on what basis should we discriminate in cases of restrooms and team sports, which is now is becoming, as you know, Martina uh, Matrachan, I can't remember her last name. I don't want to say it a lot wrong, but a big former gay activist, uh, tennis star, was had a big Wall Street Journal uh, editorial on this issue about whether, you know, people who are biologically male should compete against women. And it puts into question the whole idea of why did we have the segregation of team sports in the in this first place, which is, is allowed by the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act specifically says we can segregate restrooms and team sports and locker rooms all by sex. Yeah, by the way, she's now persona non grata to the left. Well, she is now. Um, but, uh, but she's definitely a, a voice that is hard to, you know, when you read what she has to say, she's raising some questions on this. And even some trans activists are admitting that this is an issue that needs to be discussed, more conservative ones. And the few trans activists that will ad- admit that this is not as easy as it seems get pilloried 
by other trans folks. You know, they can't, they get attacked very harshly. In fact, I was talking to a trans person last night about that very issue that made him Republican. They said oh, they became Republican when they opposed one item on the, you know, so-called LGBT agenda and got uh, an extreme response and then said after six months and opened their eyes to where the real oppression is coming from. So, and so the issue really is, and the question that I bring to folks is, the issue of transsexuality and transgenderism is being used to shut free speech down. We can't let that happen. Uh, we can talk about legitimate issues, but then we have to, as Republicans, as, uh, identify what the question is and simply say, well, I don't want to be against discrimination against trans, so I'll just agree to whatever. And some other Republicans, which I don't, don't agree with what you're doing, immediately oppose whatever you're doing, which was what happened in our schools. Um, and instead say, well, wait a second, that's not the question. The question is, how do we segregate? It's not about non-discrimination. We are going to discriminate because trans activists are not saying don't discriminate. I mean, they're saying it, but that's not what they mean, right? Um, what we really mean is how do we discriminate, segregate restrooms and team sports? How is it fair? And when is it fair to do it by someone's emotional declaration or statement versus a biological uh, fact? And um, we should be able to ask that question and address it. Uh, the other thing that, uh, and I think if you do that, people start responding. I say, oh, I, I, now I understand what the question is. Um, you know, one of the things that makes me upset, for example, is someone says, well, um, does a person um, have the same right? For example, do you, John, have the right to enter a women's bathroom today? No. But why not? Don't you get to decide just like a trans person does? Well, I'd say I'm discriminated against. That's correct. Currently... Uh, if we follow the trans, uh, the gender ideology, which is really not trans, it's really a gender ideology. If we go by their argument that you're discriminated against trans people, well, actually, it's the opposite. You're saying trans should be able to make any choice they want, but the rest of us shouldn't. Well, that's not the same. So that's actually discriminatory. Now, the question is, is that right? Should we allow that discriminatory treatment that gives preferential discrimination to trans people against you and me? Because you know that if I went and made my own choice, or if you made your own choice, and went into the women's restroom tomorrow, there'd be some trouble, right? Um, and it's not unreasonable to ask, do we deal with these issues with trans as the way we deal with race, where we don't have any discrimination at all allowed? Probably the answer is no, because that obviously, you know, as we've already discussed, that's not going to work. Do we deal with it as a sex? Probably closer to that. Uh, or do we de deal with it where you do allow special treatment, like we do with people with, say, medical conditions, where... We think uh, preferential treatment is okay. Discri favorable discrimination is allowed because you have a unique situation, which is difficult to deal with and requires special treatment. We haven't answered that. We haven't discussed that. We need Republicans who can articulate that and be more clear. So, um, so it goes back down to the broccoli, right? Are we talking about the broccoli or something else? And by the way, um, on the broccoli, so um, I do hope other people here, but, you know, uh, what surprised me was when I first presented the broccoli argument to you, you told me you had already heard it. Right. And that was unusual to me. So I'm kind of glad that it's getting out there. Yeah, it's definitely an effective argument. Uh, and, and I'm glad it's getting out there, too, because I think it's very useful. But I, the, the other thing I want to ask you is, what do you think is the end goal for the transgender movement, really the movement more broadly is, uh, on the left? Because now we actually are seeing the left coming out saying, well... We should discriminate against people in different races. There should be black dorms and Hispanic dorms and white dorms. We uh, should have all these things. We should have different bathrooms because their argument is that because they are discriminated against, they should get their own. They've just reversed the original argument uh, during Jim Crow. So what do you think the actual end goal is for this and how should Republicans respond to that? Well, you know, let, let me make be clear. So I think one of the things I would say is I would, not even though it seems that way, I would not call it a transgender movement. I would call it a gender ideology movement because it, there is a group of folks who aspire to a gender ideology and not all trans subscribe to it. Most may be true, just like most gay people are Democrat or liberal progressive, but a good quarter of us are not. Um, so I, I, I like to one of the, you know, I like to acknowledge the fact that there are trans people who don't subscribe to what's being done. Um, so Gender ideology is what I would say. And so what's their goal, right? It's complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is because a lot of it's emotional. So there's a lot of contradiction that begins to occur in this movement. So uh, you have conflicting ideas because all of them are trying to satisfy an emotion that is 
that has been uh, embedded within the left. So on the one hand, we talk about non-discrimination. There shouldn't be discri no discrimination anywhere, right? Okay, well, then nothing. Oh, but then they say, oh, but wait a second, I'm a victim, which is another emotional uh, card that they play. So, so as a victim, I get special treatment. And now, how do, well, how do I answer that? Just to give you an example of how this is so um, amazing how far they've gone with self-contradictory logic. And you talk about Brave New World. I'm sure you've read 1984. Yes. And you remember the the the, uh, the terms double think and yes. double speak, right? Yeah. Which is holding the idea and talking about ideas that are self-contradictory simultaneously. Democrats do this all the time. Uh, two examples. Uh, senator Hirona from Hawaii, which... I'm sorry. It's got to be the dumbest senator of all yeah, time. The repository of stupidity. I cannot. I just. I'm sorry. It's just incredible. Uh, a woman who, almost in the same breath, says, "You know, people should not be silenced based on their sex, and men need to shut up." And I'm going, lady. Did you just even understand what you just said? That you're contradicting yourself. She doesn't find a problem in it. Does she finds no intellectual problem. Nancy Pelosi did something very similar. She said, you know, um, we need to treat, uh, we need to be civil and, and courteous and treat, you know, uh, respect people's different opinions. And um, for those of the, you know, if there's people who don't agree with us, suffer consequences, and so be it. Again, you just contradicted. What you said, on the one hand, you're saying civility, but then you're saying, but it's okay for consequences to occur for those who don't agree with us. Cory Booker, on his famous Spartacus speech, who talked about... I love Cory Booker. <laughs> he's always the most over-dramatized version of himself. He really is. And I love the way he talked about, and in the name of comedy and, and fostering reconciliation, I'm going to call you all names and storm out of this room. Like... Do you realize what you're doing? I mean, mm -hmm. you're saying your whole speech is about uniting and I want to unite us and, and make this about reconciliation. And by the way, you're all a bunch of crooks and I'm going to walk out of here and, and protest. And I'm you, going, you can actually see the gears turning in his head as he speaks. It's actually pretty hilarious. Oh, well, I'll have to watch. I'll have to watch it next time. I yeah, but, uh, whenever you see him speak, as he talks, you can actually see the gears turning in his head, like him thinking of what he's going to say right before he says it. Well, and and I wouldn't be surprised because I think it's a lot of it's emotion based, and so when you're just going on emotion, a lot of these emotions are not even going to make any sense, and so they don't really call out. So when you ask for what's the end game, there is an end game with gender ideology, and in the end, it comes from what was called women's studies originally. And they have a very specific view. Have you ever, are you familiar with women's studies? Yes. Did you ever attend a course? I have not. Oh, well, you should just to learn what that's about. I, I thought about it just so I can get an easy grade. <laughs> well, I don't know if it'd be easy because they might just give you enough just because of who you are and mm -hmm. what you say. But they they have a strange, and, and they do have contradicting positions. But one of their views is that all quote, gender differences, and I use gender in the way they use it as opposed to sex, but all differences between male and female are artificial. That's one of their positions. And they believe that. So that, you know, if you're biological female, biological male, there is no difference. And any claim that you have as a man that uh, says I, I have masculine inclinations is sexist, structurally or socially integrated. But then when they get to the trans, it's they reverse it. And now every masculine or feminine inclination you have is inborn, an actual genetic trait of yours that is unconscionable to deny. And I'm going, well, isn't that contradictory? Aren't you saying now the opposite of what you say for everybody else? But they are. Um, so in, in this gender ideology construct, if you will, then the only time that a man or sorry, the only time that a person can claim legitimately to have a masculine inclination if it's a biological female, then it's okay. But if you're biological male, then you're sexist. And the reverse. Um, what's their goal? I think the goal is an emotional satisfaction. Something something about these folks, when you start looking at them, is like, well, since your ideas don't make any sense and they're contradicting, clearly there's an emotional co component. There's something you're trying to satisfy in yourself. And I think in some sort of self-esteem thing, I, I, I think that there's some folks in there who look at the world and they feel somehow marginalized by it. Maybe some of it's legitimate. Maybe some of it's self-provoked. Whatever it is. But they're working very hard uh, at trying to somehow make the world in their own image of what they think it should be. But in the end, if that means denying people's free speech, they're for it. If that means 
creating laws that tell you what words you can use, they're going to go for that. If that means telling you what you can do in your business or how you can define a man or woman, they're they're going to they're going to make every effort to do that, and they have no problems with it. And that is what I'm against. Yeah, I actually agree with the uh, Matt Walsh idea of it too. He's he says that the reason they have these beliefs is because they're actually jealous of all these people who have all these qualities they don't have or they want to have. And therefore, since they can't have them, they're just going to hate everyone. That's why they actually are not just the most hateful people, but the uh, most sad people on earth. I think the studies show that uh, people in this community are usually the most sad and have the worst outlook on life. And I, I think that's uh, really a big part of it. And what, what helps drives their uh, beliefs is that if their life is so bad, that must be because society has discriminated against them to make their life bad. When, uh, Whenever, usually the actual answer is they just need to look in the mirror and uh, see about it. You talked about a... Uh, gender studies professor once. Uh, I've heard of gender studies professors, though. I actually do have a funny story real quick. Uh, one time I was walking down the sidewalk at U of H with my mm-hmm. friend, and we were talking about Bernie Sanders and why I think his ideas are stupid. And uh, as we're talking, this lady behind us just uh, says, excuse me. I said, yes, ma'am. She, she, said, she starts going off on me, how wrong I am, how Bernie Sanders' ideas are great. I don't know what I'm talking about, and I need to uh, do more research. And I said, and I, I didn't know why she was going off on this. I wasn't speaking to her. I was like, okay, okay. I said, and I shook her hand. I said, by the way, my name is John. And she said, and she, she introduced herself. She said, I'm the woman studies professor, professor at U of H. And I said, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty neat. And she said, yeah, you should come to my class sometime so you can learn more about this. I said, you know what? I might do that. Can you tell me uh, when your class meets, where it's at, and what time it's at? And she says, oh, no. <laughs> she wanted to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you can so, find out eventually. You yeah. know, uh, it's interesting that you say that because um, – you know, so going back to, you know, my days at A&M and uh, so when I was president of Gay Student Services, as you can imagine, it was a, you know, a central area. Uh, people were not out. And so that's where people would come. They could come to Gay Student Services. Uh, the only person that had to be out was like the leader. The president had to be uh, in order to be recognized. But um, my main uh, point of opposition in the end was not so much, uh, although definitely a lot of conservative uh, students uh, opposed what we're doing. But the people that gave me the most grief while I was in college and what made me eventually become a Republican were these uh, gender studies uh, folks who were taking these courses, a gender studies professor who organized all these. And they had all these weird, uh, you know, left wing totalitarian ideas that they wanted my organization to espouse. And I was refusing. I did not want to do that. I said, this is just for gay people. This is not a... This is not a, a Democrat, Republican. We're not concerned. We're just here to have gay people provide services for gay folks. We're not taking positions on anything. Um, but they didn't feel that way. They felt that we had to make it about class and patriarchy and, you know, em- eliminating gender roles, all this stuff, right? Um, and when I realized how uh, aggressive and intolerant they were so that they would not accept that it should just be gay people regardless of what they think. They didn't believe that. They said, no, if you're a gay Republican, you shouldn't be part of this because you are, you know, hitting yourself. Or you should, you know, so it was actually an exclu- They talked about inclusion, but they really wanted to exclude anyone based on their belief system. And that's when I started realizing and learning more about what gender studies was, what it really wants to do. Um, and then I started realizing the, the true uh, danger to free speech is actually coming from the left. And actually what's interesting, and then around that time, not long after, there's a guy, uh, Jonathan Rauch. I don't know if you've heard of him. I, I, I'm not familiar. He was a, a gay Jewish writer from uh, the early 80s. And he still, I think, writes, uh, he still writes. But uh, he intrigued me because he wrote this little book called The uh, Kindly Inquisitors, uh, the, the New Attacks on Free Thought. And he talked about the, the main the four different uh, areas from where free, spot, uh, free speech is attacked. He mentioned, of course, fundamental re- religion is, is one of them. But he also pointed out that the left is the new, the new danger. And this was back in the 80s. And so I think what his prediction came in terms of where the new attacks on free thinking and free speech were going to come from have borne out to be true. And I had read his book in, 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 in perspective what I had just experienced and who were the people who were most adamant at making sure I Anybody who disagreed with them couldn't have a, have a say or people coming from the gender studies programs. Yeah, and it's uh, really sad. And I, I, I kind of realized that day that she wasn't interested in conversation with me. She didn't actually want me to come to her class. She just wanted her to be right. And uh, this is a broader problem on the left. And uh, it's actually a good segue into the other thing I want to talk about. One of my pet peeves of the right is we, we kind of touched on this about the, their efficiency arguments. 
But one thing I've been saying is, like, when it comes to socialism, the right should not be saying uh, socialism is bad because Soviet Union, because China, because Venezuela, uh, all other economies collapse. They should be saying it's bad because socialism is evil. It is an ideology based on the idea that we can take your property, your money, your capital, take away the ability to make a mutually beneficial exchange of goods and services and give that out to someone else and do it at the government gun level. That's immoral. That's theft. And just because people vote on it to happen doesn't make it any less immoral. It's still theft. And that's an argument I think the Republicans should be making because when I, what I see is whenever they make the efficiency arguments that we don't, we shouldn't adopt socialism because then we'll become like Venezuela, well, then all the left has to say is, why aren't you willing to give up some of your money to help other people? Well, that makes you a bad person. And I think that's really effective with the, um, with the millennials and Gen Z because uh, on average, younger people are much more interested in the mor- in morality. That's why they hate Trump so much. Uh, g- generally, why right, Trump's approval ratings are always in the tank with them because they see Trump as a not a good person, as an immoral guy. Uh, whereas the older generation, you know, they went through Bill Clinton and everything. So they see him with his policies and they say, well, his policies are good. Therefore, I don't care about his character. And uh, so what, what, how do you feel about that? Do you think Republicans should be more focused on these morality arguments, on right and wrong arguments over arguments such as efficiency? Well, you know, when you talk about morality, it gets kind of tricky because <clears throat> there's all kinds of moralities. You know, you talk about social morality and, of course, the sexual morality, um, ethics, all these things. And um, <clears throat> but I do agree with you in the sense that um, I tend to talk about principles, you know, because um, if you talk about more. So morals. Yes, of course. And and in the end, the mor- the law has a moral component to it. You know, we've always talked about that and, and why, for example, we have laws against killing, you know, torturing animals. There's no practical human effect to us, but we, we can see that that's just fundamentally wrong and we won't do it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The um, But uh, I agree with you. In fact, uh, we got two planks that we've added to the state party platform, 304 and 310. And they, even though they talk about these issues, they also talk about this other element about socialism because it goes back to the core issue. Who is the f- rightful owner of the product? Who is the first person who gets to have a say into what I do with my hands, what I do with my mind, and, and the result of that, you know, where does it go? And is it somebody else? Somebody owns me? Because fundamentally, if we can focus on that, and socialism, of course, starts answering the question is, well, no, you don't own yourself. You don't own the result of your own labor, which is exactly the opposite of what John Locke and all the Enlightenment thinkers were trying to tell us, that we became free as a result of what they were talking about, the natural law, that you know, a man and a woman, they are the first owners of themselves, not the state, not the church. Nobody else owns you but yourself. Now, we form a compact with each other. We form an agreement. Um, but what's always scary is how many people are willing to start then saying, well, you know, now that we've agreed to this social compact on how we get get along with each other, I want to start surrendering my ownership of myself to that state so that it can determine how I should spend my money, where I should I where should it go. I think we do need to make that intellectual argument more often. I I did remember Dan Crenshaw made a great uh, speech on it uh, at our Lincoln dinner, um, and I think we need to have more Republicans to make that maybe more you know in 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 snippets that can be presented in the media very easily, but to really educate because clearly what's happening, especially with millennials, is there is a lack of of the concept of what do you really mean by socialism? Do you understand where the money comes from? Do you realize that to do what you're doing, you've got to take it from somebody against their will because you're not giving them the choice, even if they're willing to do it, it's still not a choice, right? Uh, so, yes, we, we as Republicans need to start coming up with ways to constantly remind people as to why we're against socialism. And it can't just be the efficiency argument, because if you it actually and it's another excellent point. If you make it about the efficiency argument, you'll never really win anyway. It's like broccoli. Once again, studies show studies show and people will t- name all kinds of studies. Half of them are bogus anyway. And you have a, a Venezuela already. Does it change anybody's mind? No. So there's your efficiency argument right there. It makes no difference. So you really got to go to something more deeper. Because that, that wasn't real socialism. And they're always going to be able to say right. that because there's something went wrong. For some reason, they went wrong. Maybe Maduro is just a bad person, but we're good people. Therefore, we'll do it right. Exactly. And that is what they've been saying for the last 100 years. There's Even though it's, it's never worked in every possible... And what's interesting is this socialist experiment has been tried... 
actually, more than any other experiment, in all kinds of cultures. We've even had the chance to see it work in three different countries, divided in two, so that no, you couldn't even you couldn't even argue. Oh well, it's a different country. Okay, well we had three different countries where we split it in half, and we had half of it go so you know socialist or communist, and half of it not. How did that work out? In every instance, and you say, well, you can't even say that it was part of the same uh, culture. No, because one was in Germany, then we had Vietnam, and then North Korea. Very different societies, all of them, and yet in every case, same result. It never never changes. And yes, that doesn't matter because it, you could you could come up with a million efficiency arguments. They'll never work, uh, except for some reasonable people. Yes, reasonable people will look at it. But for these other folks that are enthusiastic about it, it's really, again, once it comes to an emotional argument and an argument about principle, fundamentals, and the moral idea, do who has the ultimate right over what you make? When you, when you go to work and you make that product, doesn't the person who pers- the first person who's entitled to the result is you and your family? Right, and uh, to take it even further, if something infringes on your rights to life, liberty, and property, then that is evil in of itself because these are rights given to you by God and by a Creator. And I can get into religious arguments and all that, but I but I, I believe that if you don't believe your rights come from a higher power, then you cannot expect to actually have those rights in any serious way. And so, what these uh, uh, communist powers did of the um, 20th century, like the Soviet Union, North Korea, East Germany, uh, Venezuela, things like that, is they they had a belief that if they can create a greater society, then that means that people are either two things. They're tools to get there or they're just obstacles. And therefore, since they're obstacles in our way to greatness, we can run, we can run roughshod over them, which is why there's been serious human toll. Uh, in these socialist countries, and you see, even the socialists in America believe that today. Part of their that's why they have believe in censorship, uh, censorship so much. They believe that people on the right are obstacles, uh, not tools to get there. Therefore, we should cut them out of the public debate. And by doing that, you've now dehumanized those people. And in the Soviet Union, you had 20 million dead. I think in uh, Ch- China, I think it's around 100 million. Uh, the Great Leap Forward. Uh, North Korea is a giant gulag state, and Venezuela they're eating dogs. But that's not seen as a bad thing. That's seen as just peop- uh, obstacles you have to overcome to, uh, you know, to to that paradise, to that utopia. And this is, I think, Republicans need to make more arguments like this. It's evil to run roughshod over people because they might be an obstacle to your plan because they have the same rights that you do. And I just don't see that argument being made that much. I'm seeing it being made more now. I think the new Republicans that's been elected are making those arguments much more than the old guard. But I still think we need to do a better job at it. Now, uh, what's, I find that interesting that you say that because, I mean, Young Americans for Liberty, uh, that's a libertarian group. And I know the libertarians attract a lot of atheists. So, I, I, I mean, I know you're the interviewer, but I'm just curious, in your group, don't you have some atheists in your group? Uh, y- yes, we do. I'm actually a conservative. I'm I'm the VP of oh, okay. my, my group, uh, but I, I'm a conservative, and I uh, I uh, h- highly believe that in order to have a functioning society and a base for that, you have to have a set of values based on a higher power. I actually plan on writing a uh, book soon about why you cannot have a society uh, that's based on uh, society or humanity alone. Why there has to be a higher power to get there. Well. I- I personally wouldn't disagree with you on that. The, uh, I will say, though, that when you're dealing with the public sphere, uh, you have to be careful on how you position that that, that argument because uh, it kind of goes back to, you know, um, people using the Bible yeah. as a justification for... I, I, I only use that for philosophy and roots. I don't use that for policy. Right, uh, exactly. And so as long as we talk about principles and concepts and moral... Yeah. Court, I personally subscribe to that idea. I do. I have a lot of atheist friends, which I respect. Um, and and you'll, you'll find that... Uh, in the libertarian movement, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, folks who are atheists. Uh, some are agnostic atheists, which is different than it, um, you know, an atheist atheist, I guess. Um, most of my friends are actually what I call agnostic atheists. But um, so when you're do- when you're making these arguments, you have to make sure that you're talking from your pers- own perspective. Right. But I agree with you that um, I, as a as a matter as a matter of my personal opinion, I do I would say that. Um, I cannot. It's very hard to defend natural right without explaining where it comes from and why another human does not have the right or the the moral right to, um, uh, uh, you know, or subdue it. It's just right. there is no, you know, and this is a, a discussion that you know 
has gone on for hundreds of years, especially in the, in the 20th century with Bertrand Russell and Nietzsche and, and where does morality come from? Like, can morality really exist without a higher power? And a lot of people say it cannot. Um, I'm one of those folks that tends to agree with that. But I understand that there's atheists who have a different opinion. Right. And that's why I want to tackle those arguments. But I think in the end, uh, you see these uh, powers of the 20th century, these uh, evil powers, these, co- these communist powers. You see that once they uh, well, a big part of uh, socialism and communism itself is the idea that the structure that built our society is the problem in of itself. Therefore, if you get rid of the entire thing, you can create a grand society. And clearly that's failed every time. I think the reason that's failed every time is because it has an atheistic sense to it that uh, rights do come from government and that if humanity is good at its nature, therefore we can all band together and try to make something great, which is actually, which is, which is exactly what Robespierre said, in the French Revolution. And uh, it's exactly what the uh, the Soviets thought. And you see a lot of heads got chopped off uh, uh, because of that. And so that's why I think by having an actual system based on an idea of, I, I like Ayn I Rand's Rand. idea of, um, uh, oh, not, not, I, I just forgot what it was. Well, I, was, I, I did want to say something, just if you don't mind yeah, interrupting yeah. there for a minute. Yeah, but, uh, well, well, you know, I, I, so this is why free speech is so important. Mm-hmm. Uh, no doubt our, our country, you know, when you talk about the fundamental, how it was established, the Declaration of Independence tells us specifically where, where our founders thought our rights came from. And we, we, we have to recognize that it was in that framework, in that context of mind, that's where this whole idea of, uh, the, even the idea of natural rights, it comes from something that's been given to you from a higher power, and that's why nobody else can so do it. Now, we understand people are going to argue against it, but that's why it's so important to make sure that, you know, it, we have confidence in, in free speech and discourse as long as people are educated and are able to exercise that um, that right. And so the first duty of each of us is to make sure that, that your your ability to make that case continues on and nobody tries to um, find a way because I do think that in the end, um, if you're right, you'll win. And if the, if the contest remains open, if free speech remains, continues the way it has for the last 200 years, and I think generally for the most part, America's done a pretty good job in letting people have their say. That's how things have changed, right? right. And um, uh, so I would say that's the first order of business and that's an order of business that even atheists can agree with, Right. And then let them make the case. Let them make the case that they think it's something else. I would agree with you, though. I, you know, in that debate, if I entered that debate, then I would say, I, I think we make a mistake if we start denying the basis of the Declaration of Independence. I think that is an important debate to be had now because uh, usually I don't believe in making religious arguments for policy issues, but I think the argument has shifted now to what is our society, what, who are we as a people, and what it should be our goals in life. And I think that those on the left are trying to redefine that and I think that's very bad for society. So if there ever is a time to argue that, I think it's now. And it should be argued on those levels of roots and structure, but not on the, the policy level. I think policy level should have practical implications within uh, the rights of man. But when you have to explain where those rights come from, because, you know, the left says now things like free speech in and of itself is bad and dangerous. Of course. And uh, I, I think once you get to that point, you have to start arguing for the roots uh, and the, I think the proper roots to argue about that is that those roots do come from a higher power uh, in a structure that's based on the ideas of that higher power. I would agree with you that um, any person, um, Republicans who believe that, should be making that case and should not shy away from it. Um, I don't. And the only, you know, all, my only caveat is just do it with respect. Make sure that you respect folks and you're not right. insulting anybody, particularly atheists. I, whenever I speak to people, um, I will not mince words on what I what I'm what I want to say and what I believe um, but I want to recognize that not everyone agrees with what I'm saying I agree with what you're saying though John I think too many Republicans who have these views that you and I have are afraid to say so because they think they're going to insult somebody going I don't think you're not going to insult an intelligent atheist, atheist on this if if you're smart about it if you're civil and you make your case because they're going to make their case too don't be shy about it and do not let the left intimidate you from making that case arguing what you just did Arguing for the case for a higher power as being the, the resource of that is not a racist comment. It is not anti-anyone. It is not even anti-atheist. It's simply advancing your convictions of what you think is true and important and that people should know. We, we do need to more, have more Republicans to be willing to say that, and nothing bad is going to come. Uh, no one's going to be hurt, and nothing bad is going to happen from that just because you made a case like the one you just made. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll give you the last word. Do you have anything to say to our audience before we go? Uh, yes, uh, visit at, at lockcabinhouston.org. And um, 
Uh, for those of you who are Texas, uh, Texas Young uh, Republicans, I hope to see you guys in October. Look forward to seeing you there. Um, feel free to chant my name if you want to. I'm just kidding. I'll, uh, I'll leave the chant. <laughs> thank you. But uh, thanks no, uh, very much. Thank you for, for the discussion, John. Uh, I appreciate it, and I had a lot of fun tonight. Well, thank you. And where can people find you? Uh, well, you know, I don't have a personal page, uh, but they can. I, I accept all kinds of Facebook requests from people that if I see that you're legit, because um, I get some weird ones too, you know. Um, but uh, I would like to connect on Facebook with anybody who is share minded and agrees with what we're doing here. So on Facebook, I'm Marco Antonio Roberts. You can find me through Law Cabin uh, Houston uh, as well, uh, but it's easier through my Facebook page. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. I'm John Douglas. That was Marco Roberts, and we'll see you back here next week on Liberty Talks Podcast. Mm-hmm.